Let's understand the world a little better. I'm your host, Timon Wunderlich, and with me is Marlene Wind. Uh, she's a professor of political science at the University of Copenhagen. Uh, she's also special advisor to the EU's foreign policy chief, uh, Joseph Borrell. And she has published eight books, the latest one being The Tribalization of Europe, A Defense of Our Liberal Values. In light of the recent surge of populist movements and identity-based politics across Europe, many are questioning the future of liberal values on the continent. What are your thoughts on the current state of liberal democracy in Europe and what are the key challenges it faces in the face of rising tribalism? Thank you very much for having me, first of all, Timon. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, I think it's a, it's probably a pretty gloomy picture I'm gonna uh, gonna paint today, um, because since since I published my book uh, on tribalization of Europe, um, we have a new war in Europe, and uh, we have um, I'm, I think that the liberal democracy is, is challenged in a completely different way than than previously. I think uh, before the war it was very much. Um, you know, the surge of populism all over Western Europe with Donald Trump and, and, and Brexit and and uh, a lot of uh, terrible things going on internally in democracies in Europe where you assumed that uh, democracy should be going well. Uh, and now it's, um, it's a completely different kind of more existential threat that we are facing because Uh, with the war and with uh, living in a world where you have also uh, a strong China, uh, you simply have actors out there, also the United States, you don't know what's going to happen there next year. Uh, you, you, you're simply facing a situation where there are so many uh, powers who just don't buy into uh, liberal democracy anymore, who simply just fundamentally questions whether we got it right in, in Europe. Um, and uh, and I think that is very new. That not that we didn't have autocracies before, we didn't have uh, critical voices before, but the fact that you are fundamentally uh, in a situation in the European Union, in Europe, European democracies right now, where we are surrounded by political leaders who fundamentally question and even ridicule. Uh, liberal democracy. Um, I think that is new. We are threatened in a way from the outside that is different from the from the uh, analysis I did in my book, uh, which was much more how about how we uh, haven't found out the enemy inside. Uh, and the enemy inside, what what do I mean by that? I mean um, the tribalization, the way we um submit to these uh, populist voices also academics constantly telling each other that uh, well you don't understand the people so you have to accommodate to these voices and you're not even allowed to stand up for uh, human rights anymore because that's elitist um i think that was before the war in ukraine and now I think we are facing a, a different situation that is more existential, but also in a sense clearer. So maybe uh, it's you should never say anything good about a war like the one we are uh, in right now. But but what it has done to many, I think, Europeans, uh, also Americans in uh, you know at least the democratic part of of American society, is that it has made so incredibly clear that we are in this confrontation, as, as Joe Biden loves to say, between democracy and autocracy. And what do I more specifically mean by that? I, I mean that uh, what we see in Ukraine is a, a people, 40 million Ukrainians, who simply do not want to submit to autocracy and have chosen and are willing to die for democracy and the rule of law and the European Union, it's, it's so incredibly uh, touching and emotional uh, for a lot of us who follow uh, what's going on. Uh, I think it is, it is um, 
it's it's completely crazy what's happening. I know we are distracted very easily in the uh, uh, you know Western media. We are incredibly we have been, been been able to now for one year and a half to keep our our focus on Ukraine. But now we have other conflicts also in the Middle East and a lot of you know other internal problems. People get bored very quickly. Uh, but I'm still quite impressed with the attention that a lot of um, uh, people, not only uh, you know journalists and academics, but also ordinary people, have for the suffering of uh, of the Ukrainian people and the fight for democracy. So I think actually that it's become clearer to a lot of people than it was when I published my book. Uh, uh, what it means, because it's much clearer to be in a real war than to be fighting autocrats uh, inside democracies. And and that's exactly what I'm describing in my book. That is how democracy is destroyed by Democrats. Before we come to more to the uh, current times, uh, let me ask you, why do you think has this uh, tribalism um, come up in general? I think it has a lot to do with modern politics and the way modern politics works. Um, what do I mean? I mean that um, these days, if you want to win an election, um, it's not enough to have a good policy. Uh, you also need to have a whole, um, yeah, a whole team of of, of spin doctors who are um, uh, creating narratives about uh, about the dangers out there and i think what we see in in um, in, in in modern politics uh, is that um, people don't care so much about the truth or what's true and what's not true they care about whether the narrative that is presented to them is a good narrative and i think that's what tribalism is about at least in my version of it um It's really about not nationalism or populism in the classical sense. It's about how uh, political leaders. So I'm talking about populism from the top and not from the bottom. And that's a big difference. Um, mm. I'll come back to that. Uh, but how um, political actors uh, design politics, uh, to, to, of course, to win elections, Uh, but design narratives and spin narratives uh, so that people uh, like what they hear and like the story they hear um, and, and use all available in a very cynical way, all available um, kind of uh, old myths and uh, history and they pick and choose what fits into my narrative right now uh, to convince people that that uh, I should be their leader. And and it's 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 so cynical. The new type of tribalism that I'm describing is, you know, you 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 hire the most educated academics from the best universities uh, to be on your team and to design this narrative. Uh, and then it's not so important what you actually do with the power you get. Uh, because it's all about how you present yourself and whether you are successful in selling the, the, the victimization. It's very often that in the book I talk about um, uh, the Catalan independence movement, how they use the international media to showcase themselves and designing this narrative of, of themselves as being the victims, um, using very cleverly um, uh, stories Uh, that are, are, are certainly not true, but are, are very, very um, uh, appealing to a lot of people. Uh, you know, the little guy against the big guy, uh, suppression, uh, and then all the corruption going on, uh, you distract attention away from that, and you uh, are sometimes at least able to, to convince, uh, in particular the international media, that you are suppressed and that you need Uh, uh, you know, sympathy. Uh, I think we see the same in a lot of the um, um, uh, democracies, uh, or I would call them former democracies, um, for instance, in Hungary, where um, it's also 
very much high educated spin doctors who are designing the policy and uh, serving or presenting narratives to the public that are highly problematic and have nothing to do with the truth, but uh, we, which um, you know make it possible to win elections and also to destroy democracy from within. So it's much harder to detect this type of populism, this type of tribalism, which is uh, appealing to basic instincts of uh, us and them. Uh, what, what has changed there? Why, why wasn't this done before? What has changed? I, I, I think that, and I think Brexit is a very good example as well of this, where, where uh, you had B Boris Johnson, who simply threw a dice, uh, am I a Brexiteer or um, am I a Remainer? You know, it's, it's cynicism that, that runs modern politics. Um, uh, so, so there's no real integrity uh, anymore. It's, it's, it's much more about uh, how will I gain most power? Uh, which story should I tell to gain most power? Uh, and why, why is, it, is it different? Uh, I think it has to do with the times we are living in. I think we see, uh, uh, you know, designer politics draining the swamp in the United States, uh, the elite versus the, the people. Um, the techniques that are used, social media, uh, the power of of, uh, of of social media, the the echo chambers people are living in today. That's no longer like a common uh, public debate. Uh, in most countries, it's small uh, echo chambers, most, uh, it's media platforms where people are talking to each other, and and uh, nobody wants to pay for news anymore. Uh, except from the elite, so they read Financial Times and uh, um, uh, you know Süddeutsche um, Zeitung uh, or you know something uh, uh, very very uh, advanced with with very small uh, uh, texts and and very hard and long to read. Uh, but but everyone else are just looking to have their opinion confirmed somewhere. So I think the professionalization of of social media. Uh, has a lot of, of um, uh, you know, is a lot to blame for this, uh, even though I can't see how we can roll it back in any way because it's here. We, we might as well uh, maybe uh, think about how we can use it better to, to reach out to, to, to the audiences that, that are in different echo chambers. Uh, but I think that is really one of the main reasons why it's so easy today uh, to design narratives that fit your policy and uh, and then if you on top of that, as in uh, as in uh, in Hungary, for instance, uh, and Poland until recently, if you have um, the power uh, in, if you're lucky to gain, you know, win the election and gain majority, then you have the power to shut down critical media. You have the power to um, make sure that that the narrative you are creating around yourself, uh, that that is the one that is heard because the critical voices are marginalized. And um, that makes it very, very hard to, to uh, be a critical citizen and to be objecting to the corruption that is also accompanying very often these uh, tribalist actors. But against that, I would say, um... Yes, on the one hand, we have social media, uh, social media, so we get into these echo chambers, and narratives can be um, produced um, more in uh, to each individual. Uh, we had that with the uh, AfD in Germany, for example, um, uh, right um, party, which um, which put out ads on social media um, and different ads for each um, group of individuals who were um, voting for them. And um, but on the other hand, the Internet and social media enables us uh, to see different uh, views on each topic. And also, um, I think when you're in a, I don't I don't know the actual case in Hungary, but when you're in a um, in a state where uh, the media is controlled, isn't there through social media or through the Internet now the possibility to uh, see other uh, sides uh, of, of the story, other views, um, because we can. Um, look at uh, media uh, sites uh, from other countries? Completely, completely true. And I think also the social media does a lot of very, very good things. Uh, for instance, in Hong Kong, when 
there was this uprise uh, before the Chinese shut down entirely uh, the the um, state. Um, uh, social media played a huge role to mobilize citizens, and I think also the reason why um, we now see a, a very healthy uh, reaction against uh, autocracy in in Poland, for instance, which Poland is also very very uh, prominent in my book. I it discuss like most people who study uh, law and uh, law and politics and the rule of law in the European Union. They have focused for many years now on Poland and Hungary, um, and they are the reason why they managed to 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 uh, actually mobilize, in particular the young people, was uh, through social media. So I completely agree with you that that you have this kind of 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 um, uh, good side and you also have the bad side. So you have both both kind of of, of challenges, uh, but also a lot of of, um, of positive elements with uh, with with the ability to look at international media instead of your own if your own is to totally uh, taken over uh, by uh, oligarchs and um, and uh, and autocratic leaders. Um, but the problem is um, that if the propaganda that the uh, central um, actor, the, the leader uh, is using, is so incredibly strong. And if people are not well enough educated, in particular in the countryside, it's often the case, uh, they don't speak other languages. Um, they simply sit in front of the, uh, of the TV and, and watch the propaganda coming out of, 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 the, uh, of, of the, the television screen. Um, and and there, uh, I think it's it's very very hard to to use social media. Um, of course, you can say it's a generational problem. So the young generation will 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 might you know do things differently. But it really requires that you um, learn different languages and are able to 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 use uh, international media. And I think it's easier for some for some countries than others to to actually use that uh, in an active way but it has the potential uh, social media i agree with you it has the potential to um, fight suppression because uh, um, it's very very hard you can see it also in belarus and in in um, and in china and in russia that the um, political leaders are are desperate to shut down social media and why? Uh, well, obviously, they are afraid that social media and Western media and debates and criticism will sort of mobilize from below and encourage people to stand up for their rights. Um, and I think actually that's what happened in Belarus. Um, uh, and, uh, and, and it's also the reason why uh, in China uh, so much social media has been shut down deliberately. Uh, in order to avoid any kind of criticism and agitation from, uh, so you really need a big brother state to um, to suppress uh, people. But at the same time, if you look at the numbers, uh, democracy has gone back. Uh, there's never been so few democracies in the world as today. Uh, the past 15 years, it's only gone in one direction. Uh, so I think. Uh, we are in a very, very, very uh, um, challenging situation in the world, uh, and it's it it feels very much as if uh, it's become clearer after the war, uh, the invasion um, uh, by Russia uh, into Ukraine. It's become clearer to everyone that yeah, that democracy cannot be taken for granted, and it has to be fought for. Uh, one other thing I would like to mention uh, against my own argument uh, that uh, social media or the internet is also um, helpful is that I think uh, now that everybody can uh, publish and post on uh, the internet and so much information gets put out there that um, that it's hard to find the imp important information and that actually the loudest voices get through, uh, which would also be the populist uh, voices. Uh, but then again, I, I want... Uh, to make an argument or want to ask you um, uh, what you have to say against this. Isn't there also an argument to be made that if the people are, um, are subject, if they are, um, uh, if they are inclined to uh, 
thri uh, thrive off or go after these um, less educated or less well made arguments. And um, if they uh, if they go after these and are educated through these, um, so not well educated, mm -hmm. um, is there an argument to be made they shouldn't be voters? Oh my goodness, <laughs> you will never get me to say that. <laughs> uh, and I'll be, I'll be, uh, you know, my head will be cut off. Um, <laughs> no, I mean, that's democracy, you know. Uh, I think it was Churchill who said the democracy is the least worst, uh, the least bad thing. Uh, so, of course, uh, you cannot uh, sit on uh, in, in an ivory tower and choose who should be allowed to uh, uh, to vote and who shouldn't be. Um, but I think we need to be much firmer on fighting disinformation and, and false narratives. Um, that is something also the European Union has become much better at. Uh, there's now a whole office in, uh, in the European uh, External Action Service in Brussels uh, only looking at false narratives. I think it had a lot to say in the, during the, the Brexit referendum. Uh, also, the way that foreign powers try to influence uh, uh, and, and, and sort of put foreign nar narratives into, um, into national debates in, uh, in Western countries, um, the way that they are um, uh, closing up with uh, populist leaders, giving money to uh, campaigns of Marine Le Pen and uh, uh, maybe also, uh, I don't know, Wilders, whether he got money from Brussels, but he should, or, or from... Uh, from Putin, but he's certainly very, very positive towards Putin. Uh, so I think that uh, using um, these narratives and false stories uh, is something we need to fight much more uh, uh, intensely and be less naive. I think we have been incredibly naive uh, since, since the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, 30 years ago. Um, uh, and, and we just thought everything would be fantastic and great and the liberal order and everybody wanted democracy. Uh, and, and in reality, uh, uh, what we have seen is this kind of attempt to destabilize. And I think a lot of these movements that, that I'm talking about in my book, Brexit, uh, Catalan independence, uh, um, autocratization of uh, former democracies from within, I think that is something that is orchestrated to, to at least some extent from the outside, because what is the biggest wish for so, someone like, like Putin? I think it's also something we have only come to realize within the past two years, how, how, how incredibly powerful it actually is, this type of hybrid war. So it's not just the trenches, uh, the muddy trenches and the cold trenches right now in Ukraine where the fight goes on. It's it's in our democracies. It's uh, op-eds in, in, in newspapers, in Western uh, respected media. Uh, all of a sudden, there is a, a sympathy for, uh, for autocrats. Uh, all of a sudden, a lot of people want to vote for builders, in, like in the Netherlands the other day, um, and, and uh, uh, vote for Brexit and then, then uh, you know, regret it afterwards uh, because the, co the economy, of course, goes terribly wrong. Um, but but one person is happy about that, and that is uh, Putin, because he knows exactly that destabilization, uh, the turn against liberal democracy, uh, the turn against uh, the values we stand for, uh, uh, basic human rights, and so on, all we learned after the Second World War that we should care about, that to destabilize, to question that, to um, constantly... Um, uh, sort of uh, create uh, question marks to to establish uh, to the establishment and to uh, 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 tradition the traditional democratic way of doing doing politics, appealing to the dissatisfied those who are unhappy with the, that situation um, is is uh, is exactly what what they want and they use um, political leaders like like uh, like Orban. Uh, and uh, put them on and and uh, also uh, of course uh, builders uh, to to, uh, to 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 sort of forward these arguments that you should not be happy then i know that you're going to ask me uh, what about the real problems that people have uh, and don't you care about those yes i do um, but um, there is this debate in populism uh, theory about 
uh, how do you explain the rise of populism? And you have two schools there, more or less. You have the school saying, it's the economy stupid. And uh, then you have the school I belong to where I say it's culture stupid. Uh, and, and the economy stupid is perhaps more on the left side of the uh, realm uh, of the, of the uh, uh, spectrum, uh, saying that it's, it's inequality that explains populism. Uh, for me, that is just too easy. It's simply too easy to say, okay, so if you, and I also think uh, evidence proves these, uh, these arguments wrong. Because what happened in Poland, uh, when, when Poland became a member of the European Union, um, they were just as poor as Ukraine was. Uh, Ukraine stayed outside, Poland came inside, and had an enormous rise in wealth over the next uh, uh, 30 years uh, with, with, with you know, access to the market, free movement of workers, a welfare state built up, everything restored uh, in the big cities. Uh, a very rich uh, upper middle class, um, and they still voted for the autocrats or the uh, authoritarian uh, peace party. Uh, so I think it's not just about uh, it's not just about the economy. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm just saying it's not enough to explain the rise of populism with with um, uh, with that uh, argument. You have to see. Uh, culture, and when I say culture stupid instead of economy stupid, what I mean is exactly what I said earlier about uh, the way you design politics in an identity political way. You create uh, identities and you create opposing identities as well. Uh, you use identity politics in a right-wing way, not in a left-wing way as, as uh, a lot of right-wing uh, you know, commentators in the United States, they always criti criticize identity politics for being uh, vocism and, and leftist. Uh, my argument in the book is that you also see uh, identity politics on the right. Uh, and, and that's exactly when you use uh, and create narratives uh, using the history, using false uh, dichotomies, using creating enemies that are not really there. Instead of spending time and energy on fighting corruption, on engaging in how we can create a better society, uh, preserve democracy and engage people in, in public debates. Uh, you spend all your time on distracting people away from the corruption that's going on and to, to, to get them into this mode of, of fighting. Uh, for instance, in Hungary, it's always just Soros, who is the big enemy uh, but also migrants who are not there because there are no migrants in Hungary. Uh, but but this creating that we are being invaded by uh, by by uh, migrants or by Jews or whatever whatever it is uh, by George Soros and his billionaire uh, money or academics who are elitist and and not understanding the real people uh, and this kind of positioning of the real people while laughing all the way to the bank, because we are seeing these oligarch networks who are, you know, uh, let's keep them distracted. And then they will not question how I uh, divide uh, the money I get from Brussels with all my oligarch friends. That's what's going on. And that's what I mean when I talk about uh, a, a culture stupid and cultural identity politics in my book. Uh, so uh, we have this kind of of tension between those who say it's all about the economy, it's all about the world has become less equal, that creates populism. I don't buy that. I think there's more to it. And I think you need to understand culture as well and the professionalism, the cynicism that we are seeing in politics today. I think uh, I think part of that is uh, not only to blame on the politicians, but also on the media, who is also um, engaged in this um, yeah fear setting. I would say in a way. Um, do you see any way to fight that? Oh, that is uh, now we are moving uh, very quickly in the direction of um, of uh, uh, of debating the media in general. Uh, not not necessarily uh, the media, but no, also but, but, the politicians. But despite, despite that, I mean, um, I actually always admired, uh, and also in my in my research, I always admired the. Uh, 
the completely um, new way of looking at politics that we saw in Germany after the Second World War. Um, uh, it's among constitutionalist scholars, it's very often defined as the model constitutional democracy with a, a very strong emphasis on human rights and on the constitution, on courts to protect uh, the values uh, of the constitution. Um, and and uh, I think that is a, um, we, are, we are slipping away from that um, kind of uh, uh, way of thinking uh, gradually because more and more also intellectuals start questioning why should uh, why should we even uh, stick to that model of democracy that um, uh, that actually the Americans uh, uh, pushed on Europe after the Second World War. Um, increasing, um, increasingly, many academics uh, in the, the in the kind of, of world I'm I'm normally uh, uh, working in have started to sort of say, uh, well, maybe the people are right. We shouldn't let courts decide over politics. And um, and in my opinion, that shows that also at the more academic level. Uh, we are seeing a, trans a gradual kind of transformation towards more populism and towards more majoritarian thinking that politics should come back and trump uh, trump uh, uh, the law. Uh, I'm, I'm actually right now writing a new book um, uh, about this uh, that is called Democracy Without Courts. Uh, and... and um, uh, it's actually because I come from a, a place in the world myself, uh, Scandinavian countries, uh, they never uh, built their democracies on the German model after the war. They continued to have the British uh, kind of uh, idea that, that the parliament should decide and, and, and the, the parliament should always decide. So, so there should be no restrictions on, on the politicians. And um, uh, these past years, we have seen more and more uh, books, big books on, on very big publishing companies coming out saying um, um, anti-constitutionalism, against constitutionalism, uh, that we should fight uh, the constitutionalist ideology. They even call it that, uh, that, came out, that, that, that came to dominate Europe, not the Scandinavians and not the UK, but the rest of Europe. Uh, after the Second World War, where we say never again to, to Holocaust, never again. And in order to, 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 to make sure that this never happens again, that we uh, tell each other that there are bad guys that has to go to, to camps and be destroyed. Uh, we have courts to protect against that kind of populism, that kind of majoritarianism. So we talked about at that time uh, counter majoritarian institutions and courts as counter-majoritarian uh, institutions that should protect the individual against the state. And what I see right now is that we are gradually uh, starting also within uh, the academic circles, those who write about constitutionalism, to sort of say, yeah, well, maybe it's true that why do we even let uh, these judges decide anything? They are not elected. Uh, and it's an ideology, um, this constitutionalism that came after the Second World War. It's also the same kind of requirement we, we give to countries that want to join the European Union. So when we uh, take in new countries to the European Union, we have this list of requirements. We have you need to have a functioning market economy, but you also need to have a rule of law. And democracy is not enough. So democracy is just about voting, but you also need a rule of law. You need uh, strong independent courts to sort of overlook uh, the majority and the politicians. Otherwise, uh, and that's my personal very deep felt uh, uh, kind of approach to this, is that otherwise you might end again uh, at some point in, the, in, in time uh, in a situation where you start inventing enemies that you want to destroy. Uh, and, and if you don't have strong courts to put their foot down on that kind of politics, um, I think we are in a very bad place. And I'm really increasingly worried that more and more uh, esteemed academics are jumping on that wagon 
and are uh, sort of becoming anti-constitutionalists. So that's what I'm writing a book about uh, right now. Uh, and it'll probably take some time before it's finished because it's going to be, uh, 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 you know, kind of a um, uh, very empirically founded and, and uh, 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 probably a little bit more, um, uh, you know, it's going to be uh, 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 kind of an answer to all these kind of other uh, volumes that has come out. Um, so, so, um, but I think that that is um, uh, so, so a very, a very, a reason that, so this, this, it actually goes deeper, what we are seeing right now, the, the internal fight against these values that we are talking about. It comes increasingly from academics and, 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 and writers and authors, uh, media people, who are also uh, starting to question um, uh, the kind of building blocks uh, that we um, that we uh, uh, build our societies on after the Second World War, and I don't think that we in 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 my country are contributing uh, very very well to that. We don't even have a discussion about majoritarianism versus constitutionalism. Uh, it's not even within uh, uh, within uh, any kind of theoretical imagination that that majoritarianism is not kind of the ideal democracy. Uh, so so we never got that kind of uh, we never had that debate after the Second World War. We just continued with our count to the majority, and then you're right. So also when we prosecute politicians for for having broken uh, international conventions and the law, uh, there has to be a majority in parliament before they are prosecuted. You know, it's insane. Uh, and, and I think that uh, um, it's, 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 it's a very deeply rooted thing that you, um, if you want to protect and have democracy survive, uh, you need to look inside your own societies and you need to argue against those who at a very basic level do not believe that we need counter majoritarian institutions to protect democracy. Uh, and I think that's really where the debate is right now. Uh, I think that that is, um, that's why we tell Ukraine, you cannot be a member before you have an independent judiciary. That's why we tell Auburn, you cannot get your recovery fund money before you restore the independence of the judiciary. Uh, that's why we tell uh, Poland, uh, if you want to be part of the club, uh, you need to make sure that your courts are independent, uh, because also the internal market and the, the the rules of the game in the European Union is based on uh, on on the fact that we respect the same rules in order to keep equal uh, a level playing field for companies. We cannot have countries where if you get into trouble, you know, uh, with your company, you cannot be sure if you if you if you uh, have a court case or in front, uh, are, are in front of the court and need help uh, fighting uh, some some unreasonable rules, or you have been uh, uh, not allowed to extend your 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 uh, you know your um, your planned or or hire certain uh, types of workers or whatever you know it can be. If you are not sure that your voice will be uh, heard. Uh, from independent judges, then you no longer have an internal market, and that is really, really important to 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 um, I think uh, also talk about uh, that uh, and to emphasize that that it's not just because we think our values are superior to other values. I actually think they are. I think uh, if you ask anyone in the world, would you live in a democracy or uh, an autocracy? If you asked anyone who was free to speak, they would say, we want to live in a, in a democracy. We want to be able to raise our voice. And therefore, I actually think, and now I'm probably going to come into trouble here, but I think we have some superior values in, in democracies uh, uh, that we should protect and fight for every single day. But that also, in my opinion, means that we need to protect constitutional democracy, we need to have institutions that actually sometimes overrule the majority. 
when the majority goes in the wrong direction, uh, as we saw during the Weimar Republic. Uh, but as we have also seen in Hungary and Poland, uh, where you have had majorities that were voted into parliament by uh, the voters, but who then afterwards use the majorities against the people to dismantle democracy. For instance, to buy up critical media, to undermine the constitution, to put all your friends into the uh, public office uh, and, and, and the courts. Uh, in that, and that's what, how you have actually used democracy against democracy. And that is so incredibly dangerous, also because it's hard to detect so uh, every time there's criticism from Brussels or anywhere else, uh, you have had uh, political leaders in these countries saying, what's the problem? I'm elected. You know, mm. I'm elected. So that is that is really interesting. I think um, actually I want to read a, a quote that I prepared earlier from Karl Popper. Uh, and I think it's really fitting uh, right now. Uh, that is. Um, if we extend unlimited tolerance, even to those who are intolerant, uh, if we were not prepared to defend a tolerant society against the onslaught of the intolerant, then the tolerant will be destroyed and the tolerance with them. Um, I think that is perfectly fitting. I wanted to ask you there, uh, and you kind of um, answered the question already, you said with um, legislator, um, where does democracy end or freedom of speech end? Where should we uh, be intolerant towards those that are intolerant? That's, of course, a very, very di difficult and delicate uh, question because you can end up also in the, in the, in the, uh, in the wrong, on the wrong side and, 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 and since starting to censure uh, people who just have another opinion than you have. Uh, and therefore, it should be very, very delicate. That's also why I really trust the uh, judges to, to, to take on that job and to, um, um, to to put the limits uh, on uh, on the free speech to to the degree that it, it's necessary. Um, but I think that as long as your uh, speech does not turn into hate speech against others, you should of course be allowed to say what you want. Uh, but uh, we have seen very many examples of um, the use of hate speech and also the use of uh, a public money to big posters against Jews in, in Hungary. You know, uh, why is public money uh, going into posters along the highways and in the center of the city uh, depicting uh, George Soros as the big, uh, you know, um, enemy? And, and, and also uh, Brussels. I mean, it's, it's very often not just uh, particular ethnic groups that are, um, that, that, you, you spend public money fighting. It's also, uh, you know, this undercurrent of the elite versus the real people. Uh, so it's again um, using public money to, to, uh, and corruption to design these stories, these narratives. Uh, so so I, I completely agree with Popper. I think uh, we, we have been too complacent. And, and that's also a very central part in my book um, uh, that I criticize, and I got actually a, 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 a lot of uh, criticism uh, because I, I, I went out there and said, okay, so now during during Brexit and Trump, the, when they just came up, these two phenomena, uh, there was a lot of, of, of newspaper editors who said, all right, okay, so we didn't understand the people. It's understandable that they voted for these, uh, you know, Boris Johnson and, and voted uh, Brexit and, and voted for Trump. Um, uh, we should understand, we should tolerate, we should, uh, um, you know, it's, it's us who have not been kind of uh, accommodating enough. We have been living in our uh, ivory tower and now we need to embrace these movements. And I mm. simply say that is exactly what Popper wants against. And it's, uh, that is where we go wrong, uh, that we do not fight for those very values that also protect those we are not in agreement with, right? So uh, in order to protect those who disagree with us and allow them to have a different point of view, you need to protect basic rights. And, and that is uh, not just uh, to say, oh, we understand you, you should be allowed to be populist and to 
and to fool people, right? Because with this information, we should insist on basic rights. We should insist on on having a free society with uncorrupted media. Uh, and, and it doesn't come out of nowhere. It doesn't come out of the blue. We have to fight for those values. So I couldn't agree more than with Papa. I'm so happy you did that. So. <laughs> um, before we go to onto our second segment, some rapid fire questions, I would like to ask you, is there anything that I uh, didn't ask that I should have asked you? Uh, I think, uh, yes, I think actually there is a, a very important part in my book that I, uh, 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 that I will also further develop in my new book. Uh, and that is exactly who are the people and who define who the people are and what democracy is. And I think that, um, Uh, that is uh, very often overlooked uh, when populists use this argument, uh, uh, we rep represent the people. Um, and it's very rarely dealt with in, in the academic literature, uh, how we define uh, the people, uh, the voice of the people. Very often it's a minority who actually scream and shout against uh, the establishment. Uh, but very quickly, uh, it's it's uh, depicted as the people are uh, uh, unhappy with something. Uh, so I think it's very dangerous to use this, that phrase. Um, and I also think that um, it's very important to, to well, I already uh, alluded to that in my uh, intervention about majoritarianism. But I have this long uh, kind of uh, description of what uh, uh, what is democracy actually, uh, and that it's not just about voting. And we have come to believe um, also in, uh, you know, in the universities, uh, among political scientists, uh, even among lawyers, that that uh, majoritarian uh, democracy is the right uh, way to go. So I just think that that instead of celebrating every time an autocrat is elected uh, again uh, because he has the total control over the media, Uh, we should we should exactly start questioning, um, in particular if if the country is part of the European Union where we have rules for these kind of things. Uh, but even there, we are very weak and and we are afraid of speaking up. We are afraid of putting our foot down. We are afraid of taking away uh, voting power in the council when we uh, see, for instance, Viktor Orbán ridiculing. Uh, the uh, you know the European Union for its support to Ukraine, uh, where he is uh, constantly uh, threatening to put down a veto against the help uh, to Ukraine. Um, instead of and and where we can see that democracy is no longer existing. If you look at any indicators uh, measuring democracy, uh, uh, you have a country in the EU where there is no democracy, and still there is no action. Uh, I saw today uh, uh, that that he's even given uh, a, a, a part of the money that he's been uh, promised um, from the Commission, uh, and which has been held back due to the fact that he has not restored democracy. So I think we are too afraid of 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 really fighting that fight. I think the European Union has actually been quite good in in terms of Putin and Ukraine in the past two years. We have been very, very determined to to stand up for fighting for freedom, but we have been so bad at fighting uh, for for democracy in our own societies and for having this very, very uh, basic discussion about what democracy is and should be. And I think when you are a club, when you have a treaty, when you have Article Two, you should be able to much more clearly say. What does it entail to be part of this club? Uh, it's not just pick and choose. It's not just, okay, if you have elections, then you are democratic. You're certainly not necessarily democratic just because you're elected. If you also control the media, have changed the, have done, done gerrymandering and have uh, put all your friends into, uh, into the courts, then you are not a democracy. And there, I think we have been, been The European Union has been far too weak and we have been uh, far too um, timid uh, and also too afraid of letting the European Court of Justice define 
it, it has been pushed into defining uh, because so many court cases have been about these issues in recent years. And uh, so, so we are gradually actually uh, pushing the European Court of Justice into a situation where it has to define what is democracy. And some scholars are afraid of this development. They say, what about diversity? What about pluralism? What about uh, people uh, being here with their different points of view? Uh, why should a supranational court define what democracy and in judicial independence is? I say the opposite. I say, okay, if we don't have minimal, minimal standards of defining democracy, the rule of law, judicial independence, then you exactly end up where I think uh, Karl Popper did not want us to, uh, to end uh, in a situation where we cannot, even, uh, we cannot even fight for the right for those we disagree with to be able to, to speak up. So, so I think that very general principle debate about that we should lay down uh, uh, in the European Union some, some requirements that are much more um, specific about what it takes to join this club. Everyone is free to leave. You can go any time you want. You can join any other union you want. If you love Putin, go there, but do not come and say you have a right to be part of our community, which is based on the rule of law. That's, that's my point. That's also the point that I make in my book. Yeah, now that I have uh, now I have to ask you though, um, if they are if you, they need to be laid out more specifically, how would you specifically um, lay them out? What would you specifically say? Well, I think uh, it's actually not a very long and advanced kind of basic uh, uh, common understanding we need uh, that or that needs to be respected by everyone. It really is about holding elections having free uh, media in all countries, making sure you are not gerrymandering the electoral um, uh, com uh, uh, communities or changing uh, the electoral rules along the way as you go along when you have a majority to do it. Uh, make sure that the judiciary is truly independent. Uh, make sure that people can vote, have the possibility to vote that you are not restricting voting in some way, uh, for instance, shutting all uh, voting uh, booths at, at, at a certain uh, hour uh, to limit a certain group of people to go to vote. That kind of basic uh, rules of the game, that's all I'm asking for. I'm not going to uh, argue that we should be uh, democracies in, in any specific way. I think it's still up to any country to have their own constitution and their own uh, kind of uh, cultural uh, approach to things. But everyone should respect those basic rules. Otherwise, we cannot work together. We also... These are, as a, these as are not yet, yet necessities? What do you say? These are not yet necessities? No, no, no. Media freedom they not, is not... They, oh. they, are not they are not necessities. Today, wow. they are put into Article 2, but there's no... Um, a kind of uh, insistence or sanctions on uh, on states, uh, on member states, on politicians who are uh, breaking these rules. We are gradually now seeing cases coming to the European Court of Justice because of what happened in Poland with the uh, undermining of the judges' uh, independence, where the European Court of Justice has to uh, define more clearly why what Poland and, and Hungary did was illegal. And there, in defining that, they have to also define and depict very clearly what does judicial independence mean in European terms. And I think that, that uh, so we will be moving in a direction where it becomes clearer. Uh, but you can ask, why is it the court and not the politicians who are speaking up about this? Why is it not Brussels? Why is it not the council? Why is it not... Uh, Uh, the heads of state and government who said to, to say to uh, Orban, now you have to d decide, do you want to be part of this union? Do you want to live up to the values we have? Or do you prefer 
to 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 go uh, uh, to to Putin and 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 join his union. I mean, uh, of course, uh, Orbán would always choose uh, 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 the European Union because that's where the money is, and he loves the money. Uh, he sticks them in his into his own pockets and his friends' pockets. That's what we have seen. It's not something I say. It's it's documented uh, that there's so much corruption. It's the most corrupt country in the European Union. Um, so uh, uh, so we are seeing a situation right now in the European Union where you are putting all the problems to the European Court, uh, asking the court to define democracy, asking the court to set down its foot against these countries. Uh, instead of politicians really standing up for these values and, for instance, taking away the voting power, which is possible today, to take away um, uh, the voting power in the council for uh, a, a country like uh, like Hungary. Uh, it's been going on, out, uh, on now for since 2010, and we are still talking about doing this, even though there is so much uh, data out there on... Uh, how democracy is is no longer existent and how corrupt uh, even EU money. So it's our money, you know. It's 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 you know ordinary citizens who are paying into uh, these corrupt systems, and still there is not uh, anything happening. And then of course you might ask me, why is nothing happening? Why are the politicians not doing anything? And there I think um, citing my 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 good colleague Dan Kellerman from. Uh, um, I think he's in Georgetown University right uh, now. He he used to be at, at Rauders in in the United States. Now he's he's just moved. Uh, he has this, um, uh, you know, he's been writing so much about this uh, this uh, autocratic equilibrium, uh, uh, where he he simply says that 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 the way the EU is constructed. As an old boys network, the council is really uh, all the politicians are. Oh, we don't want to be uh, unfriendly with anyone, but because what if we get into trouble at some point? We don't want that, so we try to not, you know, so we we give the court all the, the 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 difficult tasks to solve, and then at the same time they blame the court for being too uh, aggressively uh, um, uh, fighting for these uh, or insisting on on these basic rights. So it's um, it's it's something inbuilt in in the system that uh, we have right now, and that's also why I'm a de- I'm a defender of treaty change. Uh, there's a lot of discussions right now in the European Union of whether you should change the treaties when enlarging with nine new countries uh, in the next ten years, fifteen years. I don't know how long it will take. Uh, and and you have the status quo uh, uh, people coming from the council and the political. Uh, from the member states, the capitals, they don't want to rock the boat. They don't want to have big discussions about the treaties. Uh, they are afraid with it will mean new referenda, uh, and 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 maybe the whole thing will fall again, like it did in 2005 with the Lisbon Treaty or the constitutional treaty that then turned into the Lisbon Treaty. Um, but but I just cannot see how we can make a European Union with 40 uh, with the 30 uh, uh, something countries work if we have unanimity voting uh, if if you have more Orbans coming into the club uh, who are vetoing everything uh, if you have countries that are not really democratic or have no tradition for democracy and you are not able to sort of defend those principles so that's why I'm in favor of, of, of changing the treaties. And I think we can do it fast. That's also an argument that it takes a long time and so on. But I think it's a question of political will. Uh, unfortunately, it's not there right now. Uh, but the European Parliament uh, so, uh, just voted uh, that they uh, definitely think that uh, we need treaty change. Now, in regards to your time, we will have to go over to the rapid fire questions, though I would like to... Uh, dwell for a little bit longer on one um, of these rapid fire questions. So usually these are uh, two to three sentences, uh, if you can. And uh, but one um, does interest me in particular. That is um, <clears throat> now that that we talked about these uh, problems also uh, with the media and, and with informing uh, the public and informing oneself. Um, how do you inform yourselves? What media uh, publishers do you trust and why? Um, 
I am I'm a very keen user of, unfortunately, <laughs> keen user of, of, of X, uh, even though I'm not a big fan of uh, Elon Musk. Uh, I, I'm still there and maybe I'm going to change to another platform soon because all my, my good colleagues are, are, are leaving. Um, I really, really love the uh, and follow intensely the commentary uh, of, of bright people that I trust uh, in that, uh, so on that social media platform. So uh, despite all the nasty things that are there and, and the uh, commercials that I hate, uh, when, when I see someone commenting uh, on an event uh, that I trust, uh, an academic, a journalist, um, uh, and, and, and very often you see uh, long, long analysis of, of things uh, going on in the world, uh, interpretation of a court case or a new article journal that, uh, that uh, article in a journal that has been published, then there's a long kind of analysis of what am I saying here? Uh, what is my argument? Um, but it can also be bright journalists who are uh, have a, a new perspective on the situation in Israel or the United States, it can be a uh, um, commentary on the Trump campaign or uh, what's going on in, 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 the, in the UK with the, with the court case against, uh, you know, the, the government uh, that was not allowed to send refugees to Rwanda. I'm not going to the uh, necessarily uh, first to the original source. Uh, I'm, I'm reading those I trust and I know really have the knowledge and who are respected uh, academics. And I read their analysis and then uh, I go to the source itself. I mean, the, the, I go to the, to, the, to the court case and read that or whatever the journal and read that. So um, using uh, all the kind of free uh, accessible uh, commentary and, and news outlets uh, that, that is possible, uh, international, uh, uh, that's really, that's why I, 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 I'm, I'm a big fan of, of, of social media in that sense. Uh, but of course, I wish that, uh, that uh, it, was, uh, it was run in a more clever way and that we could get rid of all of this information. But but I would I would be really sorry to to uh, to to have to to shut that down. I must admit that. Now, if um, a new global issue would come up in a country or region that you uh, do not have um, a Twitter account uh, that that follows uh, these news um, that you that you not already follow, um, how would you select someone? Um, how would you select someone you could trust um, on there? And oh. what? measures maybe or how, how do you look at the people then i uh, what i do is that i very often look at those i do trust if they trust a certain source then i also trust it so mm. um uh, i i very often those i follow uh, if they start uh, uh, you know recommending a, a certain uh, um, kind of um, analyst of of china or you know i'm not very much into into Asia, so so I always depend on on others to understand what's going on there. Uh, but then I would go there. I would I would I would look at one of the most respected journalists in New York Times or Financial Times or uh, those I know know about uh, China, uh, and then I would uh, if they say this is really really interesting, what uh, this analysis, then I would go there and I would read it because it's recommended. So that's you know. Um, that's how I, I uh, uh, you know, also to minimize time. So uh, listening to, to, to those you trust, I think that's, yeah, that's the, the way could forward. You, could you name uh, three to five of your favorite uh, Twitter accounts? <laughs> oh, if you my, have them, if you uh, have I, no I, more. I think I, think I can't, uh, I, and I don't want to because... Um, there are, there are so many uh, that I really, really trust. Uh, I think uh, some of them are, are academics uh, and some are journalists uh, com com uh, commenting on, on uh, the rule of law and, uh, and European democracy and um, backsliding democracy. Um, so so I don't, I don't want to pinpoint anyone in particular. I, I, I think uh, I would probably have to mention at least uh, 20. <laughs> 
uh, if uh, if I were to listen to anyone. Well, then, if you uh, want to see um, uh, who Marlene reads, you can go on her own Twitter handle. Yes. I will link it down. Go and check who I read. Yes, <laughs> that's very easy. Yeah. So uh, let's go over to the rapid fire questions now. Um, the real rapid fire questions. So okay, I would uh, please ask answer. you to yes. answer right. Yeah, short answer, two to three sentences at best. Um, note some of these are personal or not necessarily linked to your research. Um, yeah, let's start off with a personal one. Um, if you had a big billboard, let's say on Times Square, everybody would see it. What would you put on it? <sighs> Protect democracy, I think. Um, I think, yeah, we need to remind people of how important that is. So protect democracy and remind people to do it every day in everything they do. That do you have it. a favorite quote? You should have prepared me for this. <laughs> <laughs> um, Intuitive answer. What well, comes to uh, mind? I think the 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 Seabat book, uh, "How Democracies Die," um, is 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 a, a, a very very kind of appealing uh, because it makes you think: Can democracies really die? Uh, I I think that 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 would be uh, that would be one. Um, uh, I think we have to 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 face that kind of questions. Uh, in a in a in a very very delicate way, uh, and we need to realize that we contribute ourselves uh, destroying democracy if we don't fight for it. What's your newest biggest insight? <laughs> uh, in academic terms or in uh... not necessarily in ge in general. <sighs> it can also be on life. What life? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> oh, that's actually um, very hard to say uh, because I think it would probably be something linked to my research. But um, if it if it should be more personal uh, on a um, uh, a more, on, on a more personal uh, plane, it would probably be that I have come to realize in in an advanced age um, that. The glass ceiling for women is much, much harder than I thought in the sense that women are not only up against male competitors, and I'm talking here about jobs, I'm talking about academic advancements, women are also up against other women. That is something I've come to realize increasingly uh, also by talking to other women. Um, you know, I, I, I was one of the first uh, uh, professors in political science. Um, uh, in in Denmark, uh, and uh, I used to think that of course I'm you know appointed. That's that's obvious uh, because it's merits. But I realize more and more that uh, what you're really up against is not just men. It's also a lot of women who want to keep you down because they want uh, or prefer a man to a woman. Uh, so so that's uh, an insight I have only acquired uh, in the past uh, few years. Interesting. Um, what would you have liked to know when you were 20? Maybe that. <laughs> I've uh, read that. Like to know. Um, I would probably have uh, preferred to um, to engage more in uh, uh, right from the beginning, even though I was one of the early ones uh, to engage in a public debate, uh, I would probably um, have liked to have had the courage uh, much earlier uh, to 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 really fight for what I believe is is, is right, um, and that is something you need from home. You need you need that that kind of instinct from from home. Otherwise, you you have to learn by yourself how important it is. I think I learned quite early. I started very early to write uh, obits in newspapers and columns, and uh, I've continued for for uh, for for all uh, years that followed. Uh, but um, I have a son who is uh, twenty and who is leading the European Federalist Movement in Denmark, 
and and he is just a fighter uh, and uh, out there and and doing it and traveling the world. Uh, and I really envy him uh, that I didn't do the same. Um, what do you say is the biggest problem um, with the EU currently? I think that is exactly what I talked about earlier, that uh, it's dysfunctional in a sense that uh, it's so unsure of itself and so unsure of how to insist on its own uh, identity and basic values. We are constantly talking about the EU should be a global actor and a strategic actor on the global scale, mostly because everyone else treats us like that. You know, whether you want it or not, we are we are perceived as that today after the war in uh, in Ukraine. Um, but the lack of self-confidence, the lack of insistence on those values that that the community and the union was built on, I'm, I'm flabbergasted again and again by, or blaffered, I would maybe better say, by uh, the unwillingness to to stand up for for those values, uh, because I think it has become, as I said in my introduction, clearer and clearer uh, that um, that that is 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 uh, necessary if the EU is going to exist in uh, 30 years. We have to really get ready, and we need to. Yeah, to be much more self-confident about uh, about what we stand for. Um, a controversial opinion. I believe what almost nobody else does. A controversial opinion of mine? Yes. Do you uh, have one? Are you controversial? <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I'm, I'm considered to be very polemical and controversial. So, yes. Um, a very controversial opinion is the voter is not always right. Uh, I think it's very controversial to many uh, colleagues uh, who are studying voter behavior. It's very popular. Um, but no, the voter is not always right. Uh, and I see. I think we see so many examples of that. Uh, and, uh, and, and we just need to insist on that because sometimes the voters uh, is disinformed and uh, have their information from places where they actually go and vote for something they regret later, but, or, but also uh, uh, something that is destructive for democracy. So for me, democracy is more important than, uh, than, than uh, uh, necessarily you know, hailing a, every individual vote. It does not mean, however, that they shouldn't be allowed to vote, but I'm just saying I wouldn't agree necessarily uh, with a voter who votes for Trump. So, and I, I, I think I should be allowed to have that point of view. I, I think so too. Um, what do you think of Ursula von der Leyen? I actually think that she is an absolutely incredible personality. Um, I had a talk in Brussels very recently with um, a, a colleague or a civil servant who said, did you notice that the German French engine is not working and hasn't been working for a number of years. And I said, and, and you normally told uh, that the if France and Germany agrees, then e the EU will move forward, right? Uh, and I said, well, you're right. I didn't even think about it. And it isn't working. It's absolutely in tatters, the French German uh, 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 engine. Um, uh, Scholz has his problems internally with the government. Uh, Macron has his personal uh, uh, problems internally in France. Uh, and still, the EU has actually accomplished an incredibly lot, both with COVID, fighting COVID, uh, and, and, and the war, all the sanctions we imposed on Russia, and the um, kind of insistence on uh, the EU being present in the fight for democracy in Ukraine. It might be that von der Leyen has not been very good at what happened. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. Did you see me? Uh, can you see me? Uh, I, I did see you, yes. Uh, it was just a black screen. Uh, but, oh. but should I uh, go? Con continue, yeah, yes. I just continue. Um, 
So she might not be, uh, uh, and I'm not so impressed with her uh, as regards the internal democracies, democratic situation in the union. I think she could have been much tougher on 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 uh, uh, on Orban and also been much more insistent on on uh, what happened in 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 uh, Poland. Uh, and we have other countries as well that have pro severe problems that are not spoken about. But when it comes to Ukraine and it comes to how she handled COVID. I think she has done a fabulous job, uh, and and she's present everywhere. She is insisting. She's principled. She's incredibly powerful. Uh, she is someone you 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 recognize. I think uh, the EU has for many years had um, male commission uh, heads who uh, not very many people would recognize them if they saw a picture. Uh, and uh, from the very beginning, von der Leyen has been, been incredibly aware of how she appeared. Uh, I know it annoys someone. Uh, it anno annoys some people that she's so, she's so incredibly good at social media. But I actually think that she has given a voice to, to Europe. Uh, and, and therefore, I'm, I'm overall positive, in particular after the invasion of, of Ukraine, for her being so clear and so insisting on on democracy uh, and, and on the values. Uh, what I would have liked is, of course, also for her to fight for democracy inside. And I think actually that's more difficult. It's easier to take a stand on Putin. Uh, it's much more, it's much harder to criticize your own uh, and to insist on democracy uh, among your own. And, and I hope if she's reelected for a second term that she will take up that challenge. Uh, now, just a little reminder, uh, shorter answers would be pleased. That would be awesome. Um, uh, there are two more questions left. Mm -hmm. um, the next one, um, I will just ask. Um, what do you think, or what, are, to your opinion, are the most important metrics to, um, to study a, a political leader or to say if he's, he's a good leader or not? Uh, of course, it's personal integrity. Um, it's um, if there's one thing I really dislike, then is it's uh, it's this populist kind of rhetoric uh, that you're speaking for the people. Uh, so I prefer cool leaders who are have integrity and who uh, stand by what they think and who are not so obsessed with. Uh, with uh, you know uh, telling stories or being on social media all the time, um, so integrity. I think that's uh, that's the word. Um, how would you spend ten billion dollars to make the world a better place? Ooh, I think that's impossible to answer because you can pour money into Africa. Uh, Children who are, uh, you know, fighting for their lives, have no parents. Uh, I think right now I would probably give them to Ukraine. Uh, I must admit, I think we need to step up there even more than, than we have so far. I think that uh, we simply need to win that war. Otherwise, we are doomed also in, Euro in, in, in the rest of Europe. So, so I think I would spend them on Ukraine uh, and helping uh, those who... Um, fought for liberty, but came came home without a leg or a, 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 an arm because they stepped on a landmine. All their children, uh, children of those who, who died and, and, and uh, gave their life to this. Uh, so yes, I think that would be the answer. Well, thank you very much for taking the time. If uh, you uh, want to know more about uh, Marlene and her insights, uh, check out our book, The Tribalization of Europe, A Defense of Our Liberal values and um yeah thank you again it is there it is thank you